welcome everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. We're really excited to have Dana Skurlock back with us from Staffing Boutique talking about a really interesting thing that Dana, I was thinking about this, you know, we wouldn't have spoken about this kind of like during the pandemic or mm -hmm. because people were freaked out about their jobs. And yeah. they were like, I remember Katie coming on saying, look, whatever happens, don't quit until you have another job because, you know, the employment market's all wacky. And then all of a sudden it shifts and people, there aren't enough people to hire and, you know, all this. Yeah. So this is going to be a really interesting conversation because um, a lot of things yet again are changing and um, we're going to get our guru of all things in terms of employment and specifically the nonprofit sector because yes. we work differently than other sectors. So um, again, if you don't know who I am, I'm Julia Patrick. CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd um, and CEO of the Raven Group has the day off. Actually, she doesn't really have the day off. I think she's conducting um, a training. <laughs> so she's working hard, just not on the nonprofit show. Each and every day we have these amazing partners such as Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, staffing boutique, where Dana Skurlock comes to us from, Nonprofit Nerd and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the people that come with us each and every day on this amazing journey as we finish up our third year and we start our fourth year of broadcasting. If you've missed any of our episodes, you can find us on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, and Vimeo, and of course now on podcast. For the last year, our executive producer, Kevin Pace, who we were kind of complaining about, I was complaining about earlier, but throwing him some love at the same time, <laughs> um, trying to, uh, he takes all of our episodes and has put them into podcast, which is like super cool. Okay, back to you, my friend, Dana Skurlock. Yes. I'm doing great. Um, like we were talking about before, it is springtime. My birthday is in May. So this is my favorite time of year. Um, so everything is going very, very well. I would say we're very busy, um, which is a good sign because it also means that people are hiring and there are jobs and people are shifting around. And, and so that means that there's a little breathing room in terms of um, the employment process and for candidates and for clients that are hiring. Um, our topic today is one of my favorites because I love seeing people be passionate about the nonprofit sector and want to come into the nonprofit sector. I think that it can be a little overwhelming. I think that it can be something where people aren't sure how to go about it. And so when I'm speaking with people individually, I'll try to like give them some information that I've collected just by virtue of being in staffing for nonprofits for so many years, but you know, it's, it's really great to see somebody be able to make that transition. Um, and so I'm excited to see, you know, hopefully the people listening today are in that vein that are looking to make a transition into the sector and can use some of this advice. Right. You know, Dana, it's such an interesting thing because I feel, and I, I, I'd love to get your opinion about this, but I feel when there's been like social upheaval, mm -hmm. And also personal upheaval. Maybe you've had a death in your family or you've had the death of a relationship or a, a move, you know, physical move, home change, that people do this kind of like self-reflection, self-centering. And that's where a lot of times work in the nonprofit sector rises up. Like people that are, they say, you know, I, I, I'm, I was doing a soulless, I was leading a soulless life. And I want to lead a life of import and you know community. I'm going to look at the nonprofit sector. Seems you like hit the nail really on the head. Yeah. Absolutely, I, I couldn't even tell you the amount of times that I've heard, um, in no uncertain terms, that you know working in a corporate environment has depleted the person, and and so they are finally in a position to make a transition into a job that they feel like 
contributes to the overall community that they live in, um, whether that be locally, nationally, internationally, whatever, but that they are interacting with their fellow man and that they are, you know, giving back in some way and that they have always had a pull to do that, but have never had the opportunity to. And I completely agree with you. The last time I saw this type of influx happening was when it was a recession in 2008 and the housing market crashed and yep. everything changed. You saw a lot of people who no longer had job security, um, you know, and like you said, just personal upheaval due to all these changes that were happening to us collectively that now are finally answering sort of the call that they've had for a long time, um, you know, of, of wanting to participate in the nonprofit sector in a more concrete way. Um, and so I'm seeing that again, you know, it's almost 15 years later since the like recession that I've lived through because my working life has been from like, let's say 2006 or seven when I moved to New York to now. Um, so within that, like almost 20 years, we've had the, the the great recession, we've now had the pandemic. And so I would kind of bookend my experience at working in staffing so far with those two large events. Um, and one of the results of those two um, singular events has been people from the corporate world wanting to get into the nonprofit sector, which is great because I think it helps to diversify the talent pool that's out there for nonprofits. I think that also nonprofits can benefit from bringing in institutional knowledge from like big companies or financial firms. Like there's there's some benefit to that. Um, I think that sometimes it can be a mind, um, it, it can be a challenge to change people's minds about like people changing directions career-wise. Like, I just think <laughs> yeah. that there's some hiring managers and some people who may never want to make the switch simply because they have this kind of stagnant thinking about, you know, well, if you're in this industry, you should stay in it. And that's some candidates feel that way and would never want to jump to a nonprofit because they think they couldn't. And that also applies to like hiring managers that you speak with. Some are open to taking somebody with a, an unusual background for a job and some aren't. So some of it is also personal preference biases, you know, and so it's great that we also talk about all of those implicit biases now. I think we're all fluent in that type of um, language and evaluation and like questioning a lot of like the practices that have been in place for a long time, whether that's, you know, in relation to diversity, equity, inclusion, or just, you know, our own biases about, you know, college education or our own biases about what sort of background somebody has to have. I think we're all questioning all of those things. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's an amazing thing, and and I think that I really appreciate you bringing that up because um, it's so much more subtle than gender, ethnicity, and age, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it 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 has these pieces that are so pervasive and and fear based, and nothing's mm -hmm. more fearful than when you're thinking about making a major like shift in your life. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you from personal experience, I was in publishing for 30 years mm. and when I decided to work 100% in, in uh, the philanthropic space, mm. I had pushback from my family who were like, wow. oh my God, you're going to hate it. You know what I mean? And mm. so there's a lot of pressure to conform to the norms that we're maybe comfortable with yeah. or looking at new things. One of the things that you have brought up, and I think this is a really interesting thing to talk about, is you you say find your tribe and look at maybe a professional networking groups. Are you saying getting in front of people that maybe you don't know and, and opening yourself up to new things? Or what does that space look like? Well, for the nonprofit sector specifically, um, I think the nonprofit sector it, it, here in New York, which is the, the geographic area I know the most about, is great about allowing and providing networking opportunities for people working within the sector, whether that's through YNPN, which is a national organization, um, which stands for the Young Nonprofits Professionals Network. They, you know, I used to go to events of theirs for years obviously as the name implies, it's for people in their earlier part of their career. Um, but if that is you, it's a great way to start meeting people. It's a great way to get involved with either digital events or, you know, back when I was going more regularly, it was in person here in New York. Um, and so it's a chance to sit down with other people that are also interested in the nonprofit sector, whether they're working for a nonprofit now or not, they're people that are interested in it. And I just think, 
the more you expose yourself to the environment you want to be in, talk to the types of people that you would be working with, it's also a chance for you to try out the sector and see if you even like it. You know, like it's, you know, obviously a networking event is not the same as working nine to five somewhere, right? <laughs> but it will give you at least a taste of the ty- types of things that are going on in the sector. It can give you great talking points for interviews that you have. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine going into an interview and, and you know, somebody's asking about your nonprofit experience and you're like, none. Have you ever been to a nonprofit? No. You know, it's much better to be able to say, well, I was just at this, you know, networking event for women in development, which is another nonprofit um, social group here in, um, in New York city, you know, like, oh, I was just at that luncheon and we were, you know, talking about X, Y, Z. Like it, it would add so much breadth and, and volume to your interview. I think, especially if you're um, in the midst of, um, a career shift from a mostly corporate background into nonprofits. Um, I think the other thing to remember, and this is really just a technical note, is that if you're coming out of corporate, the nonprofit's fiscal year ends in June 30th. So it is a totally different cycle in terms of like budgeting for new positions for the year, when the job searches start. Like, so that's just something to keep in mind too, because I think a lot of people coming out of corporate, they're just not thinking that way because obviously we, you know, are mostly used to the fiscal year ending at the end of December with the calendar year. Mm -hmm. And so with nonprofits, it is important to note that, that, you know, the time that you're thinking may be the best to start job searching actually may be different because of the nonprofit sector being different. Um, Love that you brought that up because that is so true. And I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that context about where budgets are and and also what the what's going on within an organization. I mean, it's a tough time for everybody. Usually they're they're just pushing so hard to finish up the year. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, I love that you brought that up. Fascinating. That that's really fascinating. Another thing that you talk about and I think it kind of dovetails into the um the, the piece that you mentioned about networking and, mm-hmm. and engagement, maybe if you, we, we use the word engagement, is that you bring up the, the notion of volunteering and how that can also be a gateway into making some of these changes. Talk to us about that. Sure. I mean, the nonprofit sector is a sector of exposure. And what I mean by that is like, if you have a mission um, driven organization, you want your mission to be known by as many people as possible because you're trying to bring, it's not like a hedge fund where you can barely find their website and you don't actually know their name and who works there and it's it's shrouded in all secrecy. (laughs) The nonprofit sector is the opposite. They have their entire staff lists online, ways to contact them, ways to get involved with the organization because the whole point is they want to complete their mission. And that usually if it's something anything related to poverty alleviation or, or something community-based, that means involving the community. And so what's great about that is that nonprofits are sort of open doors and they want to bring new people into the organization. And a great way to do that is through volunteering. Again, it's a chance to meet staff members. It's a chance to also scratch that itch if you're really looking for an opportunity to give back. And that's why you're called to the nonprofit sector. To me, it should be a no-brainer that you know you would want to volunteer somewhere or have been previously and that's why you're interested in the sector again you know if we're thinking about it strategically if you are transferring from a mainly corporate background to something that's nonprofit related having some volunteer experience even on your resume is going to be something that is, is going to be a very attractive to nonprofit organizations so for example if you're applying to city harvest and you have on your resume that you've been volunteering at your your church or synagogue or temple or what have you, and you've been doing the food pantry there for the past five years, that hiring manager, is it, that's going to ring a bell with them. So it may not be something you include on your resume if you're sending out to corporate, um, corporate entities, or maybe it's truncated and it's only one line. For a nonprofit application, I think the volunteer experience can be, um, you know, obviously we've talked about resumes before on another podcast, um, but um, in resume length, but obviously you don't want to make your resume like five pages long or anything over it. But I do think adding some detail about what you've done on the volunteer side is great to highlight in your cover letter and to have on your resume. And then um, if it is a situation where you are trying to move into the sector and you have not before and you haven't volunteered before, now's the time to start. There's tons of opportunities. You can find something that is um, 
as my mother used to say, that every pot has its lid. Like yeah. you will find a mission that is aligned with your interests. You know, there's so many different organizations. Um, whether you want to work with youth, if you're interested in the arts. So like get out there, volunteer, even if it's just once a month. I mean, you know, it, it really is, I think would give also some some understanding and, and perspective to people that are trying to get into the sector too. Yeah, I think it's also, even when you're in the sector, I think it's a, a, a really positive thing to see how people do things. You know, it's kind of like market yes. research, if you will. You know, if you're a baker, you want to know what the other bakeries in town are, how they're making their dough, right? I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. literally and figuratively. So, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a wise thing to do, but I, I think it's really smart, um, you know, that you mentioned this because it's, it's a way in the door that maybe people don't think about because if they're coming for the for-profit exactly. sector you can't like show up and say hey i you know i'd like to volunteer you know people would be freaked out they'd be like yeah. oh, wait a minute you know you're trying to steal our secrets right so i think this is a, a great concept um another thing that you talk about that's kind of along the same lines but it's a little bit more in depth and maybe more of a commitment is serving on a nonprofit board or a committee. Um, talk to us about that and what that might look like. Sure, I mean, every nonprofit has um, a board that oversees, coordinates with, helps to make decisions with the organization. How involved the board is, how many members they have, that's going to vary, of course, by organization. Um, and there are going to be some really big organizations that it's difficult to become a board member. Like, it's not just like you can sign up if you want to. Like, yeah. if I wanted to serve on New York City Ballet's board, I think it's $100,000 is the yeah. minimum donation. You know, it's a for year. a certain a year. Yeah. <laughs> for yeah. one year. Yeah, exactly. Every year. Every year. Yeah. And that's, you know, and that is, an, you know, a long term cultural organization, obviously that's a different thing. There are lots of nonprofits of varying budget size from everything from 500,000 to 10 million up to the sort of 50 million plus organizations that you hear about in the news a lot. They all need leadership. They all need board members um, to help with, you know, being able to bring in enough donors for corporate events, for galas for the year. So nonprofits are out there and they are looking to partner with people from the corporate world. Um, if you're somebody that is interested in working for a nonprofit, maybe not full-time, serving on a board is a great way to be very heavily involved, mm -hmm. to know that your money's going to a good cause. And you can find the budget size that works for you with the missions the type of mission that you're interested in. I think it just takes a little bit of research. You may have to um, apply to become on the board. You may have to work with the person who's in charge um, on staff with the organization, who's like the board liaison um, to get ingratiated into the board and, and get your application through and all that. But once you are accepted as a board member, it's really your chance to help shape the organization um, and potentially by extension shape the, the nonprofit la landscape. Um, now, if you're somebody who is interested in transitioning full-time into a nonprofit, being on a board of another organization, I think is a huge plus that, you know, the organizations that you're interviewing with are gonna say, this person is very heavily committed to our sector. Even, and, and I think sometimes also coming from the corporate world, um, we can lose sight of like, it's okay to be on the board of one organization and work at another. There's lots of people, there's a lot of cross pollination that way. Yeah, and I think a lot of people from the corporate world would, that would like scramble their brain to think about, like they would think of it as a conflict of interest when actually in the nonprofit sector, it's pretty common. Yeah. Um, and so, sir, you know, you don't have to work at the place that you're on the board with. In fact, you wouldn't want that to be the case. So, you know, it actually makes sense for you to, you know, try to get on the board with with an organization that you really believe in. You know, it's also about the genuine passion you have for it. But then you would be in a great position to leverage a, especially people that are coming out of the corporate world and want to maintain like their director level or executive status. I think that that can be tricky because obviously they don't want to start back as an admin and work their way up within the nonprofit sector if they've been working for 20 years. A good segue could be joining a committee, helping out with a gala, you know, they'll take, you know, professional volunteers for that um, and helping fundraise, becoming a, an official board member of an organization. Again, it's a chance for you to try out and find out what it's really like to work at a nonprofit in a less committed way than changing your entire full-time job. Mm 
Um, so it can be twofold. I think it's like, it's, it's great for your experience. It's great for the organization. You can continue being their board member even after you do get a job in the nonprofit sector. And hopefully it does help you secure that job. Um, and honestly, I've talked to organizations who they won't even consider somebody from the corporate world for like a high level job within their organization if they have no volunteer or board experience, yeah. because that's how crucial it is if you're coming out of corporate and don't have any nonprofit experience. I love that you brought that up because I I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, it it is such a weird ecosystem when you consider the for-profit and the nonprofit sector, you would never see that um, amalgamation of talent and, and focus I mean, because it would it would be problematic and yeah world. it not would be it is problematic in the for-profit world yeah but profit I love how you you tied that together and I also think that the reality of it is Dana that there's power in knowing that somebody else has trained you up uh, you know maybe like an arts organization you learn certain things that mm -hmm. then you can put into you know the human services sector or whatever yeah. I, mean, I think that's really a wise thing to think about um and i also think it's great training to know how decisions are being made because that's one of the big frustrations in the nonprofit sector so we show up and then there's this board that's pushing down pressure on us and sometimes uh -huh. like, what the heck how did that yeah. come up you know so yeah. As part and parcel, and we don't have that much time, but this is one of those things I'm really interested in hearing you talk about, and that's speaking up and promoting yourself. Um, how how do we do this? It's not, especially for females, I think it's, this is a harder thing. How do we mm -hmm. do this? You know, I think that this is a skill that some people are born with and they have no problem doing it. And they're very outgoing and extroverted and it's great for them. And I think for the other, maybe 75% of us, it's a <laughs> skill that you have to learn, develop and practice over time. Mm -hmm. The reason I think it's so important is that you could be on a board, you could volunteer, you could go to networking events, but if you sit there at the event, listen to the speaker and don't speak to anyone or tell anybody that you're looking for a job in the nonprofit sector and don't introduce yourself to anyone, the event won't be as fruitful as maybe you're looking for it to be. So I've had people that I've suggested, hey, go to a networking event, join this group, whatever. And their you know, responses after a couple of months, like it's not really doing anything for me. It's not really helping me in my job search. And so the next question I'll ask is, well, are you speaking to anybody about it while you're there? Right. Are you actually introducing yourself to the people seated around you? Are you going up to the speaker afterwards when it's appropriate, which is like when they've just done a presentation, that's an appropriate time to go up and speak to them, introduce yourself, find people on LinkedIn after the event. You know, I think now environmentally, it's not as set like kosher to bring like actual business cards. When I started recruiting, we had our business cards on us, on us at all times. Yeah. I think we're more of a digital environment now, which is great because it saves the paper, but like going on LinkedIn, if you find, you know, if you meet somebody that's next to you at the, you know, latest women in development luncheon, go look them up, email them, say, it was so nice to meet you. Let's stay in touch. You know, so really just like treating networking events as networking. And maybe you have to start with just speaking to the people around you at your first event. Like, I totally understand that you may have to like gear up for these types of things. And like, you know, the first couple of times you do it, you may only be able to speak to a few people um, just to get your feet wet and to get used to it. I think once you've been to a few events, you'll realize you can talk to anybody. Everybody wants to talk. That's why they're at a networking event. If you're on a board with the other board members, speaking to them about what you do for a living, what your goals are, you know, as it flows naturally in the conversation we were talking about before uh, the, the digital doors were open, you know, finding the appropriate times to speak to people, especially high profile people. The good thing about networking events is that is the perfect time. Like that's when, you know, it's to, you know, sell yourself as much as possible. And that doesn't mean, you know, listing all your skill set per se, but it does mean slipping into the conversation you know, I have worked at Merrill Lynch for the past 20 years. I would love to work for a nonprofit organization as XYZ, um, you know, and, and that's what my next goal is. Well, where do you work now? What are you looking to do? You know, and so it's like, even if it's just that information goes out to people, well, I know Dana, she's looking for a job. She had mentioned to me at that event, you know, when they're talking to someone else. And then if you're connected with them on LinkedIn, it's just, you know, it begets more opportunities and potentially more work and 
and interviews and, and hopefully a new job. That's what you're looking for. Um, I love that you said that because that makes it a lot more natural. It makes it a lot more um, achievable. Um, I've also heard that it's a good idea to, for, for those of us that might be more challenged with this, is to set a goal. I'm going to introduce myself to three people or five mm, people, mm -hmm. whatever, so that you you challenge yourself so that you're not just, like you said something so magical, the number of people that will be like, yeah, it's just not working out. You know, networking doesn't help for me. But your, your redirect was like, well, wait a minute, what are you doing? You know, how many people have you spoken to or have you introduced yourself to the people at the table or, yeah, yeah I think that's really a wise um, perspective to take, you know, um, because yeah. and I get it's intimidating. You're sitting down with people you've never met. They all have name tags on. They all come from, you know, potentially prestigious organizations and whatnot. But I think the, the good thing to keep in mind is that they are in the exact same boat and they're at a networking event. Everyone is expecting to be spoken to and to speak to other people. So you don't have to be as shy as like, if you see someone in the grocery store, obviously you don't want to come up to them necessarily and start pitching your resume to them, you know, because you recognize them from LinkedIn. That's why these networking events exist is for this exact reason is because a lot of it is what you know, but a good chunk of it is who you know as well. And what's good about who you know is obviously that can be unfair because people who have that access are the ones that get the opportunities. But the good thing about the who you know is that you can increase who you know. And there are a lot of mechanisms to be able to do that. Networking events, volunteering, and um, joining boards is a way to do that. I love it. I love your wisdom. And, and I'm fascinated with our conversations with you and this trajectory um, and how they've taken shape and morphed. Uh, because of the changing nature of society, you know, the mm -hmm. pandemic and all these different things. And we, we were talking in the green room chatter, even the weather changes, you know, it, it, like the brutal winters that we've had or intense heat or whatever. There's a lot going on around us as we look at maybe making a career change. And so mm -hmm. um, this has been really fun. And, and I think it's really helped uh, me to understand what are some options and kind of thinking outside the box. And I hope it's it's worked for our viewers and listeners as well. Again, Dana Skurlock, one of the masterminds over at Staffing Boutique, the director of recruitment. Check out staffingboutique.org. Uh, they are really one of the premier organizations that just do staffing for the nonprofit sector. And they work all over the place, based in New York City, but really um, a cool uh, alignment that we have with the organization because we get I feel Dana we get like the the details and and when the marketplace is changing first from you guys because you're mm. like out there in front right and so yeah. we'll be like what do you see and then you tell us and then I'm like yeah they they told us that and this is what's happening and so it's been really really cool to have you on and to get your your amazing knowledge. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd, is working off camera, I think, for a couple of days doing a retreat, if I'm not mistaken. Again, thank you to all of our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, staffing boutique. Nonprofit Nerd and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Dana, I don't want to leave the sector, but if I need to, I know who to talk to. Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm full of ideas. Which ones will work for you? You have to figure out, but no. The, yeah. It's it's one of my favorite topics. I love people like coming into the sector and and like realizing their dream of working for a nonprofit. Yeah. And, you know, Dana, we need now more than ever with, you know, the civil unrest and discourse and unhappiness and and more things being identified as problematic within our culture and our nation. We need great minds and great spirits in the nonprofit sector. Yes. Mm -hmm. So You're 100 percent right. Yeah. I mean, we need this. And so, you know, I personally call out to anyone who's thinking about making this change um, to come into the sector. I know I made a life change to move from corporate to this, and it's it's been an amazing, amazing journey. Um, I'm better at it, 
having been in the for-profit world, um, in the corporate side, um, but it's it's really powerful. So yeah, come come join us. As I yes. <laughs> hey everybody, we like to end every episode with our mantra: to stay well, so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, Dana. Thank you for your wonderful wisdom.